different. And in my own abilities, in my own capabilities, I don't have to be. But I know the one who can make me different. I know the one who can help me stand in the middle of life's storms. And today we find ourselves in week three of our series on David. And it's real easy to think that like everything in David's life was always easy and it was always good, but it wasn't. Like there's some times where it was hard, like where he found himself grieving. And today we're going to kind of talk about this 15-year period in David's life that wasn't easy. And if you noticed this morning, from the very first song, from the get-go to that last video, the two major themes have been, hey, life's not always easy. Life isn't always a bowl of cherries. Things aren't always going to go my way, but God is faithful. And today as we take a turn and as we look in David's life, we're going to see that he's different. That he's different, that he responds differently, and we're going to see that because what we see in his life is God is always faithful. As we sang that song this morning that James, he held out that note for like 30 seconds, I had to take two breaths. I'm just like, today I'm going to see if I can do it, man. And I couldn't, I had to take two breaths to get his one, it was crazy. But um, where was I going with that? Um. No, no, I got it, I got it. Um, where I was going with that is um, the imagery. Do you remember the imagery of the snow and the snowflakes? And it was winter. When things don't go so well, there are times when it feels like we're in the winter of our soul. Like we're in a season where we're just in the winter of our soul. And I don't know where you find yourself today, but I bet and I would guess that there are some in here who you find yourself in that season. Where you feel alone, where things are chilly, where things are frosty, and it just hurts. Your heart's cold. And you're like, God, I need you. God, I need you. And you find yourself grieving this morning. You find yourself suffering something. And what I would say is I wouldn't even dare speculate on what that reason would be. I would just say this. That God is with you the way he he was with David. And he's got a plan. And he's got a purpose. And if you'll remain faithful, God will bring you to it. And he'll remain with you the same way he was with David. Now... When you think about David, we've done this in two services and we've got it so far. There's three things that I think about, like that he's most well known for. But when you, who've grown up in the church, like if you've heard the stories of David, let's just, a little group participation here to get us going. What is one thing that when you think of David, what is the, one of the more well-known stories? Goliath. David and Goliath. All right. Hey, man, if we were on Family Feud, the scoreboard would light up right now. We'd be like, whoa, Steve Harvey would be giving us high fives. It'd be great. It'd be awesome, man, because we just went on the board. You're right, David and Goliath. And last week, we talked about one of those more well-known moments, David and Goliath. And we talked about slaying the giants in our lives. Okay. There's another moment, and it's, it's not really like one of the pretty moments. And maybe if it was up to David, it would have never made it. But it wasn't up to David. It was up to God. And God wanted to make sure that moment was in there too. It would be David and Bathsheba. Yep. One of the more well-known moments of his life. Well, there's another one. There's, see, there's something, and I'll prime the pump here. David was known, and it's, one of the, it's the third thing that I, that I resonates in my heart when it comes to David. But it's what he's known for. David was known as a man after God's own heart. Now those things are things that get all kind of airplay. Like man, you talk about slaying giants. You talk about ruling. You talk about about, um, being a man after God's own heart. But let me tell you something that that doesn't get the, the press. Let me tell you about something that doesn't get the play. Is that if you look at David's life, he suffered greatly. Like one of the things that made David a man after God's own heart is like he knew what it meant to grieve. He knew what it meant to suffer. And we're going to pick up the story in David's life where he's kind of heading in to the winter of his soul. And yet throughout all of this, we're going to see God's faithfulness. And so as David is 15 years old when he kills Goliath. And for the next 15 years, we're going to see David enter this 
new season of life, the season of grieving, the season of suffering. And it's going to happen on the heels of a great victory against a giant named Goliath. But now some new giants are going to come into his life. And man, I think that that's something that we can all relate to because sometimes it feels like, man, life throws us a curveball and we didn't see it coming. And we're like, oh my goodness, that's not good. And then it just piles on and it piles on and it piles on. And we're like, how are we going to, how are we going to make it through this? Well, this morning, there are some lessons from David's life that we can all learn that, man, when seasons, these winter seasons of life uh, come along, we'll be able to navigate our way through them. And so I would ask each of you who brought your Bibles, and I hope that you did, man, please open them to 1 Samuel chapter 18, and let's just see what's going on in David's life. David has just uh, killed Goliath, and we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 5. And it says that, like, whatever Saul sent David to do, David did this so successfully that Saul gave him a rank in the army, a high rank in the army. Now, this pleased all the people, and it pleased Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistines, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, and they were singing and they were dancing with joyful songs, with tambourines, and a lute. I don't know what a lute is. I just think they forgot to put the F right there. So if your translation reads lute, but you know what it is, come tell me afterwards. It just sounds like a cool instrument. All right. As they dance, they're singing a song. It doesn't sound like David's suffering yet. Everybody's celebrating, right? Because they're singing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of. Saul was very angry at this. Uh, and this refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more could David get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. I want you to think about what's going on with David so far. Like, man, David shows up and he beats Goliath. Man, there's a, there's a, there is a fight to be fought. Saul puts David out there and they're victorious. But man, as soon as people start celebrating, as soon as people start crediting David with more, Saul's posture towards David changes. And it's no longer going to be coming up to him, oh, David, way to go, punch him on the arm, David, you're the man. There's no more of this. Now we read that Saul begins to keep a jealous eye on David. And we read jealous eye, but you know that jealousy is more than just seeing. Jealousy is a very, very strong emotion. And so it's not what, da it's not what Saul's saying to David anymore, it's what he's not saying. It's like when David comes around, Saul's just kind of looking at him a little bit different. Like, can I trust you? Saul's looking at him a little bit different, thinking, are you coming after what I've got? And the body language, the body language changes. The conversations all of a sudden get a little bit shorter. And David's like, hey, he's probably thinking, like, if you've ever, if you've got a close friend, if you've got somebody that you've been in a relationship with, and things are going along smooth, and all of a sudden they're not, you start to figure out, you're, you start to question, like, hey, what's going on there? Like, have I done something? Like, is this me? Am I reading them right? And you don't really want to bring it up, but you just like, something just feels off. It feels off. Well, now let's look at, okay, so verse 9, from that time on, Saul keeps a jealous eye on David. Well, the very next day, an evil spirit from God forcefully comes upon Saul. An evil spirit comes up upon Saul, and if that sounds a little bit weird to you, let me just give you a historical context because his history is everything here. So the Israelite people, even including Saul, because he's a Hebrew person, he's a, he's a Hebrew king, Israel is God's picture to the world of what it looks to like to be in a right relationship with him. And that brings good things. But we have a disobedient king. We don't just have a disobedient king. We have a godless king. A godless king who is disobedient. The spirit of the Lord has left Saul. And now Saul is God's picture to God's people and to the world of what it looks like to be disobedient, what it looks like to stand outside of a proper relationship with God. And I'm going to tell you something. It's scary. 
hell is not too strong of a word because that's what Saul's enduring. That's what he's going through. He's tormented. And David's role at this time is to play a harp because God's using that harp to soothe. And David is getting an up-close look. He's in the palace. You think, man, life's good. He's in the palace. He's at the king's table. Man, it's not all good for him. David's seeing up close what a heart not tethered to God looks like, and it is freaky. And I'm not talking like freaky, like, oh, look at that. I'm talking like, look away. It's terrifying. David is entering the winter season of his soul. He has seen Saul begin to, he knows the relationship is a little bit disjointed. He knows it's a little bit disjointed, but look at what happens in this moment. He's, Saul's prophesying his house, and while David's playing the harp as he usually did, Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'm going to pin David to the wall, but David eluded him twice. Now David knows that something's not right in the relationship, and now Saul just tries to kill him, and David's trying to figure out, like, is Saul just, is this like Saul getting crazy? Like, is this just a crazy moment for Saul? But if you fast forward with me over to verse 19, or sorry, over to chapter 19, Saul tells his son Jonathan, who is best friends with David, and he tells all of his, his attendants to kill David. Well, Jonathan loves David, and he's going to go tell him. So now David knows, hey, something is not right. While I don't completely understand it, we're not, Saul's not just crazy. Saul's not just tormented. This thing has got personal for Saul. This thing has turned personal, and it's scary. And David enters the season of, like, wondering why. And we see that in 1 Samuel chapter 20, David's going to end up having to flee. And this is what he says. He, goes, uh, David, or he, he gets to connect with Jonathan, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. And he asks Jonathan, what have I done? Like, what is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Now, if you got somebody trying to kill you, we can read this today and probably do so without feeling a whole lot. But I'm telling you, David, it is not feel good in his, in his soul, in his heart. He's trying to figure this thing out. And then look at what he says at the bottom of verse 3. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, Jonathan, there is only one step between me and death. There is only one step between me and death. He is panicking, and he's trying to figure out, what have I done? Like, I haven't done anything wrong. You have to consider that for the past seven years, while he served in Saul's palace, he's only ever been good to Saul. Like, when Saul was tormented, he played his best. When there was a, fought, when there was a fight to be fought, he fought his best. When God asked him to do something, he was faithful. And he's trying to figure out, why are these hardships in my life? And I would dare venture that there are some folks in here today who find themselves in a season where you would say, God, I've been good. God, I've been faithful. God, I've been running after you. And maybe there's a relational disconnect for you. And you're wondering, what have I done wrong? I don't get it. Maybe this morning it's not a relationship. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe you're like, man, God, you're so good. And all of a sudden cancer's entered my life. Maybe not your life, but somebody that you know. And you're like, why, God? Like, why me? Like, why is this going on? Maybe it's not cancer. Maybe it's not a disease. Maybe it's just chronic pain. Like, maybe you wake up every day and there's chronic pain. And you're like, when is this thing going to go away? Like, this doesn't make sense. Yesterday I felt good. Why don't I feel good anymore? Maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's a financial issue. Like, maybe you got yourself in trouble and you've been digging out and you've been digging out and you're making headway. And all of a sudden something that you can't foresee comes coming and you find yourself in a landslide and you're asking, why? Like, why is this going on? If you've ever been there or if you're there today, if you know what that feels like, then you know exactly how David feels. Because he's asking the question, Why? I don't get it. And that's a fantastic question. Why did David have to suffer? 
Well, I would answer that in two ways. The first one goes all the way back to Saul. Why did David have to suffer? I would tell you this. David had to suffer because Saul, when God looked at the type of Saul, king Saul was, Saul feared man more than he feared God. God's like, I don't want David to be like this. I want David to fear me. I want David to love me. I want David to be more concerned with pleasing me than with pleasing people because Saul has written the blueprint on how to fear people but not respect God. And the second thing that Saul did is Saul relied on himself more than he trusted God. And God wanted to make sure that David was going to be the type of leader, that David was going to be the type of king where he trusted God above relying on himself. He's like, David, I'm going to prove myself faithful over and over and over again, but I'm going to let you walk through a season of hardship. And so why did David have to suffer? I'll tell you why David had to suffer. Because God knew that David loved him. God knew that David trusted him. God knew that David had a heart for him. But God needed to strengthen that trust. See, God was going to put him in a position, he was going to put him in a role where he had to lead an entire country, where he had to take a group of people whose hearts were prone to wander in the good times and in the bad, and he needed to say, David, I'm going to put you in a spot, but I need you to seek me in all things. As you, as you as the leader, you're going to set the pace for my people, and I want them to know beyond all else that you trust me with everything that you are in order that they would trust you with all that they are, that they would trust me with all that they are. And so David is going to enter this tough, tough season, and we see it play out because not only is Saul trying to take his life, but now we see in 1 Samuel chapter 20 that David actually has to leave. David's going to have to flee the only country he's ever known. He's going to have to leave the only people he's ever known. And when I try to put myself in David's shoes, here's what I try to think about. As David leaves the country in fear for his own life, maybe the thoughts running through his mind as he's thinking about the shepherd's field. He remembers the days when he was a shepherd, where he met God, where he penned psalms, which are songs to God. I wonder if he thought about that while he was leaving. I wonder if he thought, who's going to take care of my family? Who's going to go with me? And for eight years, eight years, David is going to be on the run. He's going to be a fugitive. You see, this little storm, this little season of winter isn't entering his life for five days. It's not entering his life for five weeks. It's going to be eight years of looking behind his shoulder because Saul is bent on killing him. But yet time and time and time again, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of grieving, God is going to prove to David that he's faithful. God's going to prove to David that he's trustworthy. And this morning, if you find yourself in a season of suffering, maybe I would ask you, and maybe there will be a day I'll need you to remind me, don't ask God to change your circumstances. Ask him to remind you of his faithfulness. Because he is faithful. He is good. And I'll tell you why he's good. Because he never left David. He's like, hey, David, you got to go. Hey, you, you get a head start. I'll catch up. Man, he went before David. He went behind David. He carried David through suffering. And if you find yourself in, the, in, a, in a season, the winter of your soul, I'm telling you this morning, like God's carrying you. He hasn't abandoned you. Like he never forgot that he promised to make David king. He just said, hey, we got to do some things in you. And where is our faith best tested? In storms, in hardships. And he needed and he wanted to do that in David's life. And man, if you were to, and I encourage you to do so, you should go and you should read today. I did it not because I had to, not because I was preaching on it, because I wanted to. Man, what I did is I just read from 1 Samuel 18 to the end of 1 Samuel. It's 15 years. First seven years happened in the palace, and that's 18 to 20. But after that, it's David on the run. And it's absolutely riveting how there's peaks and valleys in his life. And we find this one moment where David, after he's fled, he goes to the town and he meets a priest. And the priest's name is Abimelech, uh, which, wow, I said that's so good. Okay, anyway. Um, 
And he's like, he's got no weapon. He's got nobody. He's got nothing. And he's like, do you have anything? And Abimelech says to him, yeah, hey, man. He's like, I've got the sword that you killed Goliath with. Like, I've got Goliath's sword. And don't think that it was the sword that brought peace to David's mind as he's fleeing, as he's panicking, as he's scared. No, you see, as Abimelech hands that sword over to David, do you want to know what David's thinking about? He's thinking about the time that he went and fought Goliath. He's thinking about the time that God was with him when he cut that giant down. And he's thinking about, man, I'm in a season of life that feels like a big giant. And if God was with me in the battlefield with Goliath and he helped me defeat that giant, this whole winter season, this season of suffering, God will be with me then. And God encouraged David in that moment. And if you find yourself grieving or suffering this morning, all you have to do is look around because God wants to encourage you this morning. He wants to let you know that he's never left you, that he's for you, that he's fighting on your behalf, that he's carrying you. And there is a symbol, there's a relationship. Man, and maybe it's just God's word this morning. Maybe it's a spirit speaking to you right now. That he's saying, I'm with you and I'm for you because he wants to encourage you to keep going. Well, David David's going to need an awful lot of that as he flees from place to place, as as Saul is on his heels. And again, like I said, go ahead and read because there's so much we're not going to cover. But in 1 Samuel chapter 23, we see this incredible moment where Saul gets word that David and his guys are over here. And Saul gathers up his army. He's like, let's get them, boys. And it says that David is on the backside of a mountain. And Saul's coming up this side. It says that Saul is closing in on David. David is the only one that knows his enemy is closing in, and he's scared. He's like, everything's closing in on me. And maybe you feel this morning like whatever it is you're facing is closing in on you. So let what God did for David be an encouragement to you the way it was for David. If Saul and his men are fleeing down the backside of this mountain, Saul and his guys are almost are only moments from cresting over, from only moments from looking down. And God fights for David because at that moment, Saul gets word that one of his cities is under attack. And he breaks off his pursuit of David. Now, Some people would say David was lucky. Some people would call that coincidence. David knew better. David's like, whew, that was a close one. Hey, fellas, do you see what God just did for us? Like, man, we were dead. Like, we were trapped. It was over. And God protected us. Man, when he felt like everything was coming in around him, he could still see God. And the question is, if you find yourself there this morning, can you still see God? God, because he's right there carrying you, he's right there with you, and he's fighting on your behalf, and he loves you, and I know this morning somebody here needs to hear that, somebody in here needs to believe it, that God loves you, that God is for you, that those songs are more than just words that we sang. They are a truth, a truth meant for your life, that no matter what you're facing, God is faithful. And hey, if it's not easy for you right now, it's okay. Like life here was never supposed to be easy. God didn't say, hey, David, you should follow me because it's going to be awesome. It's going to be easy, buddy. Jesus didn't say, hey, follow me, it's going to be easy. You know what he told us? It'd be rewarding. Jesus didn't say, hey, follow me, because it's easy street. He said, follow me, and I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. I promise to be with you to the very end of the age. And that's how he is for you today. And that's how he was for David then, and God, Jesus is with us, his spirit is with us, the way that God was with David then. Now, there's a couple things that I want to, and you would think, and I've got to wrap this thing up here. So I'm going to talk even faster, if I can. You would think after all of this, you would think after all of this, that David's heart would have been hard. You would have thought that David would have said, man, if that's what it means to be your king, God, like if that's what it means to be king of these people, you can keep it, man. I don't want this. Like, hey, I, I could care less about the palace, but sleeping in caves, like waiting for some crazy guy that you picked a king to kill me, Lord, you'd have it, man. I don't want this anymore. 
And isn't that really the temptation that we, that we face? Like when things get tough, we're like, God, you keep it, man. Is, is this too hard? Like I don't want to deal with this. But David never did that. In fact, David went so far as he never raised a finger against Saul. He never came against Saul. You know what he did? He said, God, I'm going to let you take care of it. Oh, there's something for us today. God, I'm going to let you fight this fight for me. I'm just going to trust you the way that David trusted you. And here's the other thing that just blows my mind. In the face of all that adversity, in the face of all that suffering, in the face of all that, I'll find it, it's that good. In the face of all that, David wanted God more than he wanted his circumstances to change. If you find yourself in a hard season, David wanted to honor God above all else. Even when life wasn't going so hot, David wanted to honor God more than anything. So even when he felt like giving up, even when all this was going on, he just wanted to honor God. And I would tell you, if you find yourself in a hard season like David, want God more than you want your circumstances to change. Do your best to honor God, even though it's hard, even though it's not easy. I'm going to just quick fly through this, and then we're going to give you a physical representation of the fact that God hasn't left you. Understand. Storms don't last forever. David may be on the run now, but one day he is going to be king. God hasn't forgotten. David isn't sure how or when. His job's to be faithful. One of the things that we have to appreciate about David is that he never let the bitterness of suffering sabotage the work God was doing. And if you find yourself in, in one of these seasons of grieving and suffering, don't let the bitterness of suffering sabotage the work that God is doing because God is doing a work in you. It just takes time and it just takes being tested. And it's real easy for us to become bitter like, God, really, this is what I get? Don't let bitterness creep in and sabotage what God is wanting to do in you. And it takes time. Just say, God, I need you. And that's where I would point us. The last two things I would tell you is put your hope in God. You remember that song by Micah Tyler, I Want to Be Different? When the world looks at the circumstances and situation and says, I want these to change, his perspective changed. He says, God, make me different so I can walk through what I've got to go through. How do you do that? You put your hope in God. Quit putting your hope in the circumstances to change and start putting your hope in the one. Take your eyes off from and put your heart on to the one who can make a difference. The one who can get you through the day. And then when you look at the end of the day, you can say, man, God, you were with me. God, you were good. God, you were faithful. And that leads us to the last thing. Don't let your reason to pout, or sorry, let your reason to pout become your reason to praise. Because when we're bitter, what do we, what do, we do? Every time my kid pouts, you know what I tell him? I get it. I'm 42 and you're 7. I'm 42 and you're 11. And I still pout. It's just uglier. It's not as cute. One of the things that David did so well is he let his reason to pout become his reason to praise. I'm going to tell you guys something. David was a different kind of man because he didn't let the bitterness of suffering sabotage the work that God was doing. David was a different kind of king because he always put his hope in God even when things didn't make sense. And David was a different kind of dude because he let his reason to pout become his reason to praise. And if you've got a reason to pout this morning, let it be your new reason to praise God. And you will be able to sing, I promise you, that God is good. And the world will look in there and they'll see that's different. Like that doesn't make sense. How are you able to praise when everything around you seems crazy? Well, this morning I want to remind you of God's faithfulness, a physical representation of God's goodness to you. And today we're going to receive, we're going to close our service today with the Lord's Supper. It's a reminder of God's love for you. He loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus, who suffered greatly, not for his sins, but for ours. 
And if you love Jesus, if you have a personal relationship with him, if you believe he's the way, the truth, and the life, then you're welcome at the communion table. You don't have to attend Highland every week. We want you here. As you receive these elements and as you return to your seat and hold them in your hands, think of how Christ suffered greatly for you and be reminded that he is with you now the way he was for you then and he's for you now the way he was for you then and be encouraged because he is good to you.